a, a segment of follow-up because we've talked about it before. On episode 102, we talked about atheist blogger, secularist blogger, Avijit Roy from Bangladesh, who was brutally, barbarically murdered on the streets of Dhaka. And this trend is continuing. Uh, radical Islam is is a threat we've talked about many countless times on this show this fearful segment of islam that can't face the scrutiny of any criticism of its faith or its ideologies or its philosophies is a pernicious force right now in our world just this last week another secular atheist blogger has been brutally and barbarically hacked to death with machetes, hatchets, and meat cleavers in his own home. A group of unidentified assailants hacked another secular blogger to death in Bangladesh on Friday. The victim, known by the pseudonym Niloy Neal, is the fourth blogger murdered by religious extremists in the last six months. With no one facing charges for any of the murders, the government of Bangladesh has been accused of allowing their killers to operate with impunity. After Friday prayers, six men entered Neal's building, posing as potential tenants looking to rent a flat. They pulled out machetes and confined his wife to another room before hacking him to death. Hours later, a local al-Qaeda offshoot group called Ansar al-Islam claimed responsibility for the murder. This is very troubling, and not just for the people within Bangladesh or people who live in majority Muslim countries. This is a problem and a concern, and it should be for the entire planet, because this is a... a, a an evil, this is a, a problem that we all face. In, in the wake of, or prior to, the, the deaths of the people in Paris with Charlie Hebdo, the editor, Sharp, he, he went by, he said, I'd rather die standing than live on my knees. Well, I want to welcome to the show Arif Rahman, who is a friend of the aforementioned Neil O'Neill, and a, a fellow atheist and secular blogger. And I, I want to say before, before we begin here, Arif, that I, I admire you very, very much. It's easy to, to sit within the comfort and the confines of, of, of America where we don't really face the, the threats that, that you do there. I, I know you're, you're in London, so the th threat might be mitigated slightly. You are you and your counterparts and your, your fellow bloggers are very brave individuals who face a real threat of death, and uh, you're doing a, a wonderful thing. Welcome to the show, and I appreciate what you do. Thank you. Um, it's good to be here with you. I appreciate the words. Let me ask you. I, you know, there's there's several things to to tackle here. I wanna I wanna first talk about what exactly your friend. Neil O'Neill, what, what did he write about that was so threatening to radical Islamists and the extremists, you know, Ansar al-Islam, or, you know, it's an al-Qaeda offshoot, but really the entire philosophy of this radical segment of, of Muslim thought, of Islam, Islamism, um, what exactly did he write that, that is so dangerous to them? Uh, he wrote under the pseudonym Neil O'Neill, and uh, some of the writings I can, I, I just have in front of me open, they are in Bengali. And the latest one was actually talking about uh, uh, female genital mutilation in Malaysia. And he wrote a really good article about how um, a lot of um, young Muslim girls are actually going through this barbaric procedure and the government in Malaysia are actually helping to this. So it looks like countries that where uh, Islamism is growing, uh, governments are actually in in bed with Islamists uh, and abating these sort of uh, barbaric ac actions. The trend also we can see in Bangladesh where, b b uh, not the FGM, but um, the way uh, bloggers are being killed and government is doing nothing uh, to actually protect them. But also, only today, the police... Uh, uh, super, superior, the, the chief of police had a press conference where he warned 
Bangladeshi uh, bloggers not to cross the line. That was his exact words. And he invited uh, general public to report atheist bloggers uh, to the police who crossed the line. Uh, so it was really, really disheartening uh, hearing what he was saying. Well, you know, in this in this community of yours, this community of bloggers, the risk obviously outweighs the fear because they're continuing to 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 blog. They're continuing to write. They're they're continuing to quote unquote cross the line. Can you can you speak a little bit more about about that? The fact that it's really not slowing them down. I mean, the 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 killing after directly after Ramadan, they started right back up with these assassinations, these brutal assassinations. What is it that and I admire it, but what is it that is is driving the motivation to continue at risk of death uh, to continue writing? Uh, it's actually a very long uh, history of Bangladesh and its secular struggles. Um, uh, I, I have been talking about this uh, in, in various, uh, various uh, interviews, that Bangladesh and the, the land that is we know now as Bangladesh has not been there for a very long time. Uh, 44 or 5 years ago this land used to be called East Pakistan right right and then uh, in 19 um, up until 1947 this land was actually part of Indian subcontinent and then thousands of years before that this land was part of Indian subcontinent and the religion or or the culture of this area was actually not islamic islam was implanted and kind of imported uh, in this land and uh, that means we are not in by default uh, Muslims. We are not like Arabs where the culture and the religion is Islam. So we have a very good um, uh, portion of our psyche as a secular psyche. Our, one of our part of our culture is uh, called Baul culture, which is like a mystic um, way of thinking where the concept of God is actually uh, embodied in, in human psyche. Humans, uh, humanism is kind of the oldest um, concept that we have. Now, when we see uh, over the last 40 or so years, um, or since our independence, we hoped for a more secular country, and our initial constitution had uh, uh, secularism and uh, you know uh, humanism part of our uh, constitution. But then, over the last 40 years, we have seen that uh, slowly dissipating from in front of us. And we have seen Islamism growing. Uh, we wanted to save uh, our secular ways of thought, and we saw Islamism by creeping in. It's actually taking away a lot of our human rights, uh, especially equal equal rights for women is getting cuddled. So we wanted to speak about those, and uh, we wanted to uh, raise our voice because the the people or the or the system that was supposed to do that was either being silenced or being bought out uh, either through um, temptation or fear. And all was left for us is to write blogs when we saw the opportunity uh, back in 2006 where when Internet was growing and, and people could write blogs of, from their own uh, uh, comfort and, and safety of their, and behind their keyboards. Unfortunately, our writing actually hurts the the concept of religion, especially Islam, and the respect that it demands, and thereby, uh, just by making sense, uh, we we have fallen uh, onto the wrong side of Islamism, and they have now uh, identified. Uh, we were not actually extremely hiding because we never thought we would be killed for just writing. So uh, we are now being targeted, and gradually uh, we are being eliminated. But the good thing. I think the question was, why did we still write? Because we know that by writing this uh, uh, about atheism, about uh, you know the negative effects of of religion, uh, we definitely have strung a chord, and that's why we are being killed. So, two things is, first of all, we will not stop writing because we want the snowball that we have created to grow even bigger. Good, good. And also, uh, if we stop now, the terrorists will win. 
they have they will be succeeding terrorizing us which is definitely not something we will uh, want to do so Pew came out with some numbers in April of 2013 and in Bangladesh they said that 82 percent of Muslims favor making Sharia the law of the land and then among the Muslims who say that Sharia should be the law of the land there are 39 percent that say it should apply to all citizens not just Muslims only and so it is powerful that in in the face of those numbers you still know that the secular bloggers have power against this right because if they didn't it you wouldn't be considered a threat uh, you you are absolutely right however that part of uh, that side of our our work uh, or the side effect of our work uh, is not something we have been aware of. Um, uh, a lot of us tell us that uh, this is a political struggle. And I say, we never expect it to be a political struggle. But they say, you know what, even if you didn't want it, by uh, challenging the power structure of, of religion, you have somehow entered the uh, war fields and you are you are now being you know uh, targeted for, for doing that. So... Um, we did not realize that, but you're right. I think uh, we, we some must have done something right. Well, let me, I want you to talk a little bit about, because you're, you're certainly more, more versed in the history of this region than I am. Uh, talk a little bit about, because I know when England pulled out and the, that colonial influence was, was just extra, when it extricated itself, when it was removed so suddenly, and they drew lines relative to national borders, like Pakistan, it's, you know, it was created because, oh, we think the Muslims should be here. Oh, the Hindus, they live here. Talk a little bit about, uh, about how, because I believe that a lot of this infighting was, was brought on because of the colonial influence and then the borders, these artificial borders that were just created out, you know, out of uh, thin air. Uh, you're absolutely right. Um, we we know that uh, the British um, monarch and and uh, its its intelligence was uh, has always kind of ruled the world for for many hundred years years sure. and um, they they are uh, quite smart and I think um, uh, at that time in their own interest before leaving they wanted to leave seeds of their future rules. So when, when it came to the discussion of leaving uh, near the end of World War II, uh, when British was pulling out because they have uh, sucked us dry, there was nothing more to uh, loot, and, um, and the, the geopolitical situation was changing, the world order was changing, they, um, they wanted to create political problems. Uh, so Bengal, the, the area that we know now as West Bengal of India, and the current uh, region of Bangladesh. This is a huge uh, region which is predominantly Muslim speaking. But because of that import of Islam and because of an inherent issue of uh, Hinduism, uh, a lot of over the hundreds, hundreds of years, uh, the land we now know of uh, Bangladesh had more of uh, Muslim uh, concentration. Mm -hmm. And the West Bengal side was of Hindu concentration. But although they were culturally the same, linguistically the same, but the religion was slightly different. So the British uh, created this, um, they, they, they draw this line, and uh, they said this is going to be the Muslim part, this is going to be the um, Hindu part of the Bengali-speaking region. And this is not, they did not only do it for the Bengali-speaking region, they have done it for... Punjab speaking religion so on the on the other side the western side of india there is two punjab the pakistani side of punjab right. and the indian side of punjab and this theme also happens in kashmir um, that's exactly right it's a, a major problem there yes that that division that british created and the and the problem that they left and this all keeps india and pakistan kind of occupied and probably that was one of the objectives of British before they left because obviously if you have ruled the world for a few hundred years you would have that sort of um, shrewdness um, in, in your, in your uh, you know, politics. So 
if we focus on Bangladesh um, and the land that uh, we now know Bangladesh, it was formed out of two distinctive sections when the British left. Um, Be before, l let me interrupt you, sorry. I, I just want for my audience's sake to have a little understanding of the geography there, that you've got Pakistan on the west of India, then you've got India, and then directly east of that, you have Bangladesh. So I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you for, for doing that because I forgot that, uh, you know, that visual picture actually helps uh, the audience. Um, so Pakistan and India was created out of Indian subcontinent. And Bangladesh and actually Bangladesh was known as East Pakistan and, and the West Pakistan. They were part of this Pakistan uh, theoretical state with India in between. I mean, how many countries do you know that has two sections with that much of distance in between? And Right. Th th thousands of miles in between west pakistan and east pakistan it does it it makes no sense whatsoever yeah uh, unfortunately it did make sense to them at that time and nobody <laughs> questioned which is um which is a strange thing however the pakistan is of course um as you we know i i'm i'm not generalizing about average pakistani but the but the ruling class of Pakistan, which now we know uh, kind of as, is the military generation or the, um, the, the, the head of the military, and, and Pakistan is, yeah, is well, heavily the, militarized. The Pervez Musharraf kind of uh, regime. Yeah, yeah, and, and so many like them. Uh, they obviously were not the, uh, the good people, and also they did not have the best interest of Bangladesh or East Pakistan region. Uh, at that time, Bangladesh was, um, it, I'm just kind of giving you a background of uh, how the, the, what, what actually ended up being uh, a, the liberation war of Bangladesh. Um, Bangladesh used to export um, a, a fabric, a fiber called jute. Um, it was a very, um, I think it's coming back now, but at that time, it used to be called the golden fiber because Bangladesh is a very, um, is a land rich with lots of rivers at least at that time and jute uh, grows and uh, it, it grows very well if it is if there is river near it and bangladesh have had a lot of uh, rivers so there would be tons and hundreds of tons of uh, jute produced and it would be exported the ex the um, the money that was imp uh, earned by exporting jute would be going straight to pakistan because pakistan east west pakistan was the one ruling the whole of the pakistan and they would actually utilize that money to build infrastructure in the West Pakistan. And within this short span of time between 1947 and 1971, uh, Pakistan, West Pakistan had changed their uh, capital five times. And they, they used to declare this is going to be now the capital and they would build tremendous amount of infrastructure using that money. And then after a few years, they would say, no, we are not going to declare the other city as the capital and go over the same thing. So we saw this is just a tip of the iceberg of the, of the extortion and also the uh, sucking up our, our, our fund uh, was happening. People are getting a lot of, lot of um, angry. And also language, they wanted to push their language, which is a Urdu language, which is actually based on Arabic script. Right. Uh, on our language, which was Bengali language, which is based on Semitic um, script, they were trying to push it on us, and they said, you have to forget Bengali, and you have to start learning Urdu, and we revolted against it, because we love our language, and uh, the land now we know as Bangladesh means Bangla land. Bangla is our language, which is kind of also known as Bengali. So, so that's so, kind of the... So what you're saying, there, there is a, a long tradition and history of rebellion and flying rebelliously in the face of of a of a, an oppressor so in this case radical islam really would be the oppressive you know kind of colonial influence that's trying to hold you down as a, as an atheist blogger as a secular blogger as a voice of reason absolutely absolutely you, you have let me ask you this mm -hmm. and i, I kind of want to move on to it to a different element of this and that's the fact that it, it, the Bangladesh government is, while supposedly secular, 
And, and this is kind of an, it's an interesting facet, especially for an American audience, because not having, you know, we have a, a very in deep ingrained culture of freedom of speech. And I think a lot of, you know, after a, a couple hundred years and change of being a, a nation, it's become just kind of commonplace for your everyday American. And they, it's anathema for an American to, to not be able to say whatever they want about whatever they want and have to, to think of repercussions for that is just wild. It just it can't be comprehended by your average American. But I want to talk about how the government of Bangladesh right now, while one side of their mouth says, oh, we totally we we abhor, we abhor this. We we condemn it. And then with the other side of their mouth, they are having police chiefs and policies that discourage freedom of speech and discourage blasphemy, quote unquote, blasphemy of religion. Yeah. Um if I could go quickly back um, on on a statement you just made about um, America, in a general, the freedom of speech in America is upheld. But if you remember uh, a couple of years ago, um, well, there was a cartoon show called um, where where the the depiction of Muhammad was. I can't remember the name of it. Is was it South Park? It, it was South, where, South Park on Comedy Central. That's right. That's the one, and you know the the creators and producers were were severely under attack because of of that, and I, I think at some point they had to uh, bend and and compromise of some sort uh, because of the huge tremendous pressure and also fear of retaliation. Right. So that's that's kind of a primer and a glimpse of what we are facing in a massive scale in Bangladesh right now. Um, so. Uh, what I'm trying to say, as you started uh, in, the, in the beginning, the problem that we are facing is something of a global nature. And Bangladesh is something of a very advanced stage of an infection that is, is, is very, very um, uh, uncontrollable, I should say. So would you say that the government is incompetent or complicit or some other option? Bangladesh government is very much competent, should it want to. At this point, Bangladesh government's, uh, I think, strategy is they have unleashed a a beast, and they're just waiting for the beast to level down uh, the atheistic thought process and the secular thought process. Because right now, um, Bangladesh government is actually formed by uh, people from the party called Awami League, uh, unanimous majority. And the people of Awami League are uh, mostly business persons, and the business persons have vested interest and invested investment from uh, Islamic lobbies. Um, just to give you a perspective here, um, in Bangladesh, there was a study uh, came out, I think, a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month ago, where uh, there was this chart showing the loan disbursement ratio between the Islamic bank and the state-owned bank, and it was two is to one, two to one. That mm. means Islamic government was this um, bank was distributing say four thousand units of um, loan. C unit could be millions, and I don't, I can't remember exact figure right now. Sure, and sure. It's in, in Bengali currency, but just to give you a perspective, four thousand towards the biggest uh, state-owned bank was two thousand. And that means that loan is not going outside of the country. It's being invested inside the country. That means every and any businessman who has any sort of big investment would be some sort of, uh, have some sort of uh, allegiance to the Islamic cause because, you know, business interest needs to be fulfilled. And if suddenly Islamic uh, bank says that, you know, you, you have to return our money or some sort of leverage, then the people are, are kind of, you know, they they have nothing to say. So that's that's the business problem that is causing us all this. All this is kind of a tool that the Islamic lobby is using. So, so um, it's th there is financial hostage taking here. Uh, I think so. Yeah, yeah. that's. But that, that, I mean, that's an but, element I haven't heard. I appreciate you saying that. But the thing is, I don't think the guys or, or the business uh, owners who is also the political leaders. I don't think they're very much. Um, you know. Uh, it's not the, uh, when you say use it was the hostage that means without consent but i think they are very much consenting to that 
um, uh, what I'm trying to say that their allegiance to Islamic uh, fund is more. That's what I'm trying to say. Sure, sure. So in reading about how there have been no punishments for the murders of these four bloggers this year, I read a uh, police statement from someone who said, quote, we know that Neil used to work for non-governmental organizations in the past, but we are not aware of his journalistic identity. We are investigating. So in the police saying that they're not aware of his journalistic identity, do you think that that's honest or do you think something's going on there? Um, everybody knew Neil O'Neill was a blogger. Police obviously knew, um, not because he went to the police for protection. He went to two police. I don't know if you have read this in BBC or somewhere else that uh, he actually posted about this in his own blog in Facebook and saying that today, after a protest event of a previously murdered blogger, when I was coming back home, there were two people following me. So I went to the police station claim is, uh, to, to, to um, express my fear and re- demanding protection. And the police officer of that particular uh, station said, uh, your home address does not fall into our jurisdiction. You need wow. to go to that police station. But I would suggest, and they unofficially said that I would suggest you leave the country because uh, police cannot protect you. But the thing is, today when this question was asked to the police uh, chief, he said uh, that uh, statement is not being verified, and we don't know if it is true. Of course, do you really record the police officers every time they talk? I don't think that happens anywhere. I right. Mean, uh, so it, he's just denying that that fact. So police definitely knew about it. Should they wanted to know, his name was in the list. So that list has been in circulation for for a long time now. Sure. Um, and your name also appears on that hit list, does it not? Yeah, I, uh, it's on the very top of the list uh, wow. for the, for a very long time now. And how do, how does that feel? <laughs> That's a strange question. Um, I, I don't think I feel about that anymore. To me, it's just a fact uh, of life. Uh, uh, British police has um, came to obviously have interest in, in, in protecting me. And um, uh, I, 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 I just uh, try to be safe. That's it. Well, that's good. Well, we, we want you to be safe. Well, listen, in the, in, the, in the couple of minutes we have left with you, I, I want to have you briefly talk about what exact, because I don't want this just to be, well, you're, you're coming on our show and our audience is going to listen to it. I want this to be a call to action for anybody who's hearing this. And we don't just have an American audience. We have an international audience. What can be done? How can people help in this war of ideas? Um, I think um, I was discussing with um, Atheist Republic earlier, and they were asking uh, similar questions. I think everybody who are privileged uh, and they live in a um, more um, free nation, um, one of the things we do is definitely make more uh, noise. And uh, as as individuals, we definitely can, can uh, spread the word that this is happening in Bangladesh, and don't trust the government what they're saying but keep putting more pressure but also if anybody has any leverage uh, to make Bangladesh government do more about these things I think um, because it's not going to be a one-person job it everyone has to join hands Uh, I don't know individuals if they have uh, that's because the money thing I talked about it's not only in Bangladesh it's a global problem and the, the the Um, You know, Saudi money, Saudi fund, I know that circulates throughout the globe and everyone has interest. So it's it's a difficult problem. And this is the reason it's almost like it is what it is and because it is. So I don't know how we break out from this circle, but definitely, uh, you know, hearing us and and talking more about us uh, probably would at least um, uh, make people aware that this is happening. And I don't know if, if something good is going to come out of it. Because I don't think this killing will stop. Yeah. It's very, very, very sad, very disturbing. Well, listen, uh, I want to thank I want to thank you, and I guess by extension, I want to thank uh, Faisal Saeed Al-Machar, who connected us. Um, we, we really appreciate what you're doing. Uh, you're a brave, smart, uh, you know, you, you're, you're, you've got your finger on the pulse, and um, I, I'm a loudmouth guy. <laughs> 
and I, I won't, I, I won't be silenced. And you are, you show a bravery that I, that I much, much admire. So, uh, I really appreciate you coming on. And let us know in the future if there's anything else we can do for you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for for having me. And I definitely would like to thank Faisal Saeed Al Muttar for uh, hooking us up. And I uh, I look forward to uh, talking more about these things. Good to go. Thank you. Thank you. I think that was really, really great. I mean, really, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, it was very insightful, and I, I learned a lot. He's got a big brain relative to history of that region, you know what I mean? Yeah, and I think it's good for people to hear these things and learn about these things, because I think we get caught up in our daily lives, and we don't really pay attention to what's going on elsewhere. Sure, or just isolated within the microcosm of our particular culture and country. Right. Uh, I did think it was funny. <laughs> I think he thought your how does it feel to be on an Al-Qaeda affiliate hit list i think he thought that was kind of a crazy question okay he said the word strange (laughs) um yeah i am sorry for going a little therapist on him there but um it's just an interesting thing right so he's he's living his life and he has people who care about him and i'm sure people who depend on him and he's on a hit list and i just think that that's a a fascinating thing and in america to be on a hit list is, you know, are you in the mafia or something? Like, what have you done wrong right. to like, other people? It's like something out of a movie. It's like a right. cartoon. What do you mean a hit list? Right. Yeah. And, you know, he's on a hit list because he uses his voice. And that's such a profound, strange thing. Profoundly preposterous. Right. And so yeah. being on a hit list and talking to someone who's on a hit list I just was wondering, how, how is that day-to-day? I mean, do you think right, about right. it every day? Because I think I would be paranoid every time I wake up. And I, I think, I don't know, I'm just trying to imagine, but it would be both, there would be fear-induced, but also I think in some perspective, it has to be somewhat of a, a badge of honor that, oh yeah, they want me dead I must be doing something right. Yeah, and he actually did say something like that during the interview, which is, we're doing something right. And I thought that was awesome, because in the face of that threat, in the face of death, it's, no, we know that what we're doing is right, and we're going to continue to do it, and that is powerful. And, you know, listen, he's not, he doesn't face the immediate danger, like Avajit Roy or Neil O'Neill, but he he still is living in the United Kingdom where you've got maniacs like Anjem Chowdhury running around who are giving material support to recruits to try to get people to go and join ISIL and join the fight of extreme Islamism. So it's uh, he's definitely not out of the, uh, the realm of danger. So we, we very much appreciate him. And uh, goddamn, so, so good, so good. All right, well, this is also a matter of follow-up. So staying kind of on the religious thing, um, sad time this last week, a, a, an atheist blogger, an American uh, blogger who had dual citizenship between uh, Bangladesh and America, had, was, br- was brutally murdered on the streets um, in Bangladesh. And I mean, when I say brutally murdered, I mean they, him, he was hacked to death by machetes and his wife has for sure lost a finger but is in but is in a uh, critical condition in the hospital so so this guy is an atheist blogger and he writes about um not necessarily atheism specifically but about secularism and wanting there to be a secular viewpoint in bangladesh and he was leaving a book fair i believe or a uh, a a book bazaar and was in a in a taxi of one of the the little bike taxis when a group of men stopped them and attacked them with machetes murdering him on the street and this is this is terrible and it goes to one the, the radical nature of those in religion but it also goes to the level of distrust for atheists and disdain for atheists around the globe, not just here in America, where we are the the least trusted group. People tr- trust rapists, 
and and other abhorrent individuals like that before they trust atheists in in America. So, it's if that's going on here in America, I can't imagine the climate and what it's like elsewhere in the developing and more religious, uh, extremely religious world like Bangladesh. Well, he's a Bangladesh-born engineer who was living in the United States and rose to prominence with his books on philosophy, scientific thought, and human rights issues. He had come to Bangladesh to attend a book fair as two of his books came out in the fair. And earlier in 2014, an online bookstore had stopped selling his books after he was accused of defaming Islam and the Prophet Muhammad and promoting atheism. Ugh. So obviously he's received, you know, death threats on his Facebook page. And ever since he started being prominent about his beliefs, he started receiving death threats. Yeah. And obviously someone carried that out. So. Terrible. So I, you know, I feel for his family. I certainly feel for his wife. And I hope she, uh, I hope she gets better quick. Um, what a terrible, terrible thing. 